We're going to continue to look at gastrointestinal drugs. So we've talked about emetics, we've talked about anti-emetics and anti-diarrheals. Today we'll talk more about laxatives and cathartics, anti-ulcer medication, and miscellaneous medication for the gastrointestinal system. Looking at laxatives and cathartics, their overall goal is to increase the fluid content of feces to make stools softer and promote ease of def defecation. Uses, we've got chronic constipation control, so a lot of times in cats they get chronically constipated. So trichobezoar, we're talking about hairball control and hairball passage. Evacuate the colon to aid in diagnostics, so if the animal needs a colonoscopy or an ultrasound or a radiograph and needs to have their colon emptied, then we'd often give a laxative or cathartic ahead of time. And facilitate stool passage overall, so if there's pelvic fractures or if the animal has uh, recently had perineal, perianal surgery, then we need to soften the stool so that it passes easily. Laxatives are considered the most gentle of the two, so when we're talking about laxatives versus cathartics. High doses can cause more aggressive diarrhea, however, but even the high doses of a laxative still aren't as aggressive as the low dose of a purgative or cathartic. So overall, we've got two categories. We have emollient laxatives, and within that, we're talking about lubricant oils and stool softeners. And then we have bulk laxatives, where we're mostly talking about hydrophilic colloids, so indigestible plant fiber. And this picture here, what it's trying to show is, of course, the lumbar vertebrae here and a really dense formation of stool. So really dry, really dense formation of stool in the colon. So we'll look at emollient laxatives. When we're talking about we, uh, emollient laxatives, we're often talking about lubricant oils, such as mineral oils. So within this uh, mineral oil category, oftentimes we might use this for horses. So if we're using it on horses, if we're using it on any animal, realistically, we should be giving it through a stomach tube. But most often our patients that we're using mineral oil for are horses. And we do give it through a stomach tube for impactions. So if they have small intestine or large intestine impactions, we can give some mineral oil, depending on their health status, of course, to see if we can help break things up and move things along. We do have to really, really look at use of a stomach tube in these guys, though, because we really don't want that animal to have any risk of aspiration of the mineral oil. And then there's cod liver oil and white petrolatum. So this is over-the-counter over for hairball passage. It's a semi-soft gel. It's not overly recommended, just as a side note. Um, sometimes overall, if we continue chronic use or regular use, it can result in decreased absorption of certain vitamins. So in those fat-soluble vitamins, ADEK in the intestines, this can actually prevent the absorption over time. So it's not really recommended. And of course, if it's a dog or a cat, if they are having an impaction, then really they should go to the vet. That's sort of the, the borderline statement. They should go to the vet to find out what the heck is happening. Because of course, if it's a huge impaction, it's not gonna pass with a little bit of, of laxatives. So just something to think about. And then lastly, we have glycerin suppositories. Um, most often, we would have used glycerin overall at some point for the use of pelvic fractures or colonic strictures in patients. So these are animals that are being monitored quite heavily by the veterinary staff and the veterinarian. But we typically, again, there's better options, so we tend not to use glycerin so much anymore at all. Then we have emollient laxatives, so stool softeners is what we're speaking about. Dioctyl sodium succinate is one, and it's a surfactant, so it lowers the interfacial tension. And this is a wetting agent, so it's helping to encourage moisture toward the bowel movement to help it move through. It also stimulates colonic secretions to assist with this and it allows water to penetrate the stool and soften it overall. Emollient laxatives that you may have heard of, uh, they used to be really popular and then of course we found out that there are some major issues with this particular one. So Fleet brand enemas are phosphate laxatives and also an osmotic cathartic, so they're kind of a mix between two categories. They draw and retain water into the colon. However, the downside is that the phosphorus can be absorbed. So within this, we tend to get hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, because when phosphorus comes in, it transfers calcium out. 
And then with this, of course, with hypocalcemia, we're getting muscle tremors, fasciculation, so little muscle twitches, facial rubbing, muscle cramping, stiffness, restlessness, aggression, hypersensitivity, disorientation, and seizures, of course, resulting in death. So Fleet Brand enemas used to be really popular for humans to use, whether it be on themselves or on their kids. And they often asked if we can use it on our pets as well. But the overall answer is that the risks far outweigh the benefits of using a fleet enema. So we definitely avoid this type of uh, laxative in dogs and cats. And then we have bulk laxatives, so hydrophilic colloids, indigestible plant fibers, and they create osmotic force. Unfortunately, they can result in some flatulence and some cramping, but their goal overall is to keep fluid in the feces. So they pull fluid into the lumen of the colon by overall just getting that um, hydrophilic type plant material within the lumen of the colon. So examples for this are psyllium fiber, which is Metamucil, as you know it, Bran, and most often in vet medicine for dogs and cats, we're often using canned pumpkin. Canned pumpkin has about 3% fiber and 97% water in it, so it's a really nice, really mild option as a bulk laxative. So if an animal is constipated, sometimes we will offer them some pumpkin. And also when they have diarrhea too, we'll offer them some pumpkin to help increase the amount of water intake and then also help with that fiber to help bulk things up in their, their large intestine. If you're using Metamucil, again, be cautious of the dosage. If we get too much, it can cause a lot of flatulence and cramping for the patient. And also to just always be careful with over-the-counter medications or over-the-counter human supplements because I worry that sometimes Metamucil could have things like um, xylitol or aspartame in it, which isn't ideal for dogs and cats. And then we move on to the category of cathartics. So this is to cleanse or to purge. And we have two categories of cathartics, also known as purgatives. So category number one is osmotic. These are hypertonic, and they draw water into the lumen of the intestine at greater force than the bulk laxatives. And then we have the irritant cathartics, which increase peristaltic motility and increase secretions. So looking at osmotics, I have to say we often don't use these in dogs and cats, but I will discuss them in case clients call about them. So magnesium salts, which are Epsom salts or milk of magnesia, overall there's poor absorption of the product, which is a good thing because we don't want this actually getting absorbed into the bloodstream, and it results in increased salt in the lumen of the intestine. So when there's increased salt in the lumen of the intestine, then that salt, based on its tonicity, will draw water into the lumen of the intestine and help li uh, liquefy or add water to that bowel movement. So it's hypertonic salt, and of course if a solution's hypertonic, then water will naturally be drawn toward it to help uh, dilute it. So this also stimulates cholecystokinin hormone release, which of course plays a role in peristaltic contraction, so it increases peristaltics or peristalsis. Caution, large or frequent doses, because we are working with a salt and we're working with something that has a high potential to draw water out of the surrounding tissue and bloodstream and into the lumen of the colon, then of course, Regular or high dosage use can result in dehydration of the patient. Likewise, when we're talking about dehydration, we're looking at electrolyte imbalance from absorption. So if in fact some of that salt does get absorbed into the bloodstream, then we're going to see a, um, an ideal Im a non-ideal imbalance of salt and electrolytes in the bloodstream itself. So with this, we can actually get hypermagnesemia which of course results in lethargy, depression, weakness, flaccid paralysis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So badness, definite badness. Of course, if it's very pronounced, it can result in death. And we're never going to use osmotic cathartics in cats. They're just too susceptible and too sensitive to any potential horm um, electrolyte imbalance. So just going back, uh, we're never going to use, sorry, the salt-based osmotic diuretics in cats for that reason. 
So carrying on with osmotic cathartics, one that we do use in cats is lactulose, and it's overall, again, poorly absorbed, so it typically sits in the lumen of the intestine. And this one is sugar-based, so it's a sugar osmotic cathartic. So of course, even that effect of having a high concentration of sugar in the lumen of the intestine is going to start to draw fluid from the surrounding tissues and bloodstream and dump it into the lumen of the intestine to help moisten and soften that bowel movement. Uses, we see this in chronic constipation in cats and also in hepatic encep encephalopathy, so liver failure, liver shunts. It changes the colon pH and it ionizes ammonia. It also decreases ammonia absorption. So we see it in two different cases. Most often, you're seeing this in use with chronically constipated cats. Now, we can give this orally by mouth, and it's a liquid and it's really sticky and cats aren't a big fan of it, but sometimes we just have to do it. And then we can also use this as part of a preparation for an enema. And then we have another one that we often use in cats. I don't know if you can tell this, but cats get constipated typically a lot more than dogs do. And the main reasons for constipation in cats is quite often lifestyle. So we're talking about indoor cats that aren't stimulated, they're obese, they're not moving around a lot and they're on low quality diets and they just end up getting really severely constipated. Very common. So another osmotic cathartic, we have polyethylene glycol, which could be known as laxidae for humans. We often get it as peg powder. It's an osmotic saline cathartic, less, less extreme than using magnesium salts, Epsom salts, etc. So we're typically using this in chronically constipated cats. It's a tasteless, odorless powder, and we're giving about an eighth to a quarter teaspoon twice daily mixed with a small amount of canned food. So because it is a saline cathartic, then we just have to be cautious with hydration levels and of course the electrolyte imbalance with repeated use. So this is something that we might give once in a while to a constipated cat and just ensuring that as the cat is getting their peg powder, they're also ensuring that they're getting fed wet food too so that we can try to stave off some of that potential dehydration. And then an osmotic cathartic that you're probably familiar with by now, if you work in clinic, is sorbitol. And sorbitol is an osmotic sugar cathartic. It's often given with activated charcoal to aid in toxin expulsion. So we give this typically orally as charcodote or activated charcoal that contains sorbitol. And what ends up happening is in the stomach, to a local effect, it absorbs any of the toxins that are in the stomach. And then the sorbitol aspect helps move things through. So it helps increase the amount of fluid that's going into the lumen of the intestine and help shift that bowel movement out of the gastrointestinal tract. So then we've absorbed the toxins in the charcoal and the sorbitol has helped um, moisten the stool and move things through the GI tract to completely get rid of it in the body. Risks associated with this, of course, in high doses or inappropriate use, we can get dehydration. We also can get a degree of hypernatremia as well. Um, colonic necrosis, of course, in inappropriate cases as well. So typically we avoid this in small dogs and cats. And most often what we do, if it's a toxin ingestion, we'll give activated charcoal dose with sor sorbitol for the first dose. And then any necessary follow-up doses of activated charcoal will be cathartic free. So they won't contain sorbitol. Always warn the client, watch out for subsequent black diarrhea which inevitably occurs. And I distinctly remember working with a husky who was all white and we gave this sorbitol activated charcoal orally, went down and not five minutes later, I don't know, this dog had hypermotility in his GI tract, it was crazy. But not five minutes later, that white dog shot the craziest black diarrhea out of its bum out of its rectum. It just shot it all over the place and I remember I just couldn't believe that it happened so quickly and it was so intense. So just, you know, warn the owners. It could happen. Sometimes a lot faster than we expect. Irritant cathartic. So for this one we have castor, castor oil and bisacodil, which is dulcolax. 
These ones essentially work by irritating the bowel. So they increase peristalsis and they increase secretion. So with this, the downfall is, of course, increased gas, flatulence, and cramping of the gastrointestinal tract. Most often, we're not using either of these, to be honest, in dogs and cats. It's not overly common to use either of these. But in case, you know, sometimes it is appropriate to use a compounded version for dogs and cats. So for these, we definitely do not use if there's a suspected obstruction or really impacted feces, tenesmus, where they're continually trying and trying and trying to push out a small bowel movement, or if there's pelvic, rectal, or anal surgery or injury that's been recent. So it's just something to think about because it will increase peristalsis, that if there's anything actively blocking, as opposed to just needing to remove normal stool, then of course it could potentially cause a perforation in the gastrointestinal tract. All right, we are going to move on to anti-ulcer drugs. So we're going to look at the physiology and the anatomy before we talk about the drugs themselves. So looking at our stomach, of course, these are the important secretory cells of the stomach. We have parietal cells, which secrete hydrochloric acid. And as we discussed earlier, they're stimulated by acetylcholine, gastrin, and histamine. And of course, the parasympathetic nervous system and allergic reactions will trigger acetylcholine and histamine, which in the end ends up creating a higher, higher production of hydrochloric acid. Then we have chief cells, which secrete pepsinogen, which turns into pepsin in the presence of hydrochloric acid. And pepsin is proteolytic, so pepsin is that enzyme that breaks down proteins. And this process is stimulated by acetylcholine. So also it's stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Goblet cells secrete that nice thick protective mucus. So it's mucus and bicarbonate. It acts as a big buffer for the gastrointestinal mucosa. And it's stimulated by prostaglandins. So that's that protective feature that prostaglandins uh, stimulate to occur. Mucus neck cells, they produce regularly a thinner, less, mucus, muc less, less viscous mucus which is also stimulated by prostaglandins. And then we have G-cells, which secrete gastrin, which stimulates hydrochloric acid production. So looking at gastric ulcers, overall the mucus in the stomach is fragmented by the hydrochloric acid. It allows the pepsin to eat away at the proteins in the gastric lining. So pepsinogen is converted to pepsin, and then, of course, that's proteolytic, so it eats away at the protein. So it's actually, when, when it's allowed to do so, the pepsin will eat away directly at the lining of the, the gastrointestinal mucosa. If any component of the protective mucus is not produced at the right level, we, we open up the stomach and the duodenum to ulcerations. Erosions in superficial epithelial layers, so that mucosa of the intestinal tract are what end up happening. And of course, these erosions are painful and they can be hemorrhagic and they can be perforating. And perforating, of course, is worst case scenario where the ulcer goes right through the mucosa, submucosa, etc. So right through that stomach wall. What causes an ulcer in the stomach or the duodenum? It could be anything that increases acid or pepsin and overwhelms the mucus layer. So it could be hyperacidity associated with an increased parasympathetic nervous system response or mast cell tumors. Remember that mast cell tumors agitate or they create the presence of histamine and we've got histamine receptors on the stomach that help increase hydrochloric acid, bile reflux, metabolic uremic toxins, high carbohydrate diets, NSAIDs and steroids, and stress. So again, looking at that parasympathetic nervous, stimulus, nervous system stimulation. So lots of different causes. And so with this, we just have lots of different types of anti-ulcer drugs. So the types we'll talk about are non-systemic antacids, systemic antacids, mucosal protectants, and prostaglandin E1 analogs. Non-systemic antacids. So we're going to look at ones that typically are over-the-counter most often. So we're looking at calcium, which is Tums, magnesium, which is found in magnesia, aluminum, which is found in amphigel, combo magnesium and aluminum, 
which we can find in Maalox. The mode of action overall is to neutralize acid molecules in the stomach. Caution with these ones, if we're using them. So again, we're talking about a one-time use, if that. Now we have to look back, of course, we've got an increase in some of these minerals, these compounds that are all good and fine in small doses, in their normal doses. But if we start giving calcium and magnesium every single day, we could cause problems such as absorption of magnesium and then continued use diarrhea with over um, overabundance of magnesium in the body and then constipation if we're giving aluminum and calcium in high doses in the body as well. So you could actually end up disrupting the whole gastrointestinal tract and either causing diarrhea or constipation. Calcium, too much calcium, we can actually get gastric acid rebound syndrome. So what ends up happening is too much calcium will stimulate gastrin release, which then of course stimulates that cascade for increased hydrochloric acid production. It's okay for the normal stomach, so a normal stomach can handle this rebound, this increase in hydrochloric acid, but if it's an impaired or ulcerated stomach lining, it actually can't handle it. So after the calcium has left the gastrointestinal tract, it no longer is having a direct effect on buffering that hydrochloric acid. The level of acid can increase, and of course, a diseased stomach lining just can't handle this. Another caution, we can get medication interference. So because we're altering the pH of the stomach, the goal here is to buffer and neutralize, or not so much neutralize, but alkalinize the, the pH of the stomach to a degree. We have to be cautious because some medications rely on an acidic environment, a very acidic environment, in order to be absorbed appropriately. So we are altering the pH of the stomach acid. The increased pH can cause many solutions to become more hydrophilic, which means there's actually less absorption through the GI tract membranes. Remember that hydrophilic like to jump ship immediately into systemic circulation, as opposed to hydrophobic or lipophilic, which tend to pass through the gastrointestinal tract membranes. So if we're looking at a lot of oral medications that are compounded in a, in a lipo, Philic formulation. If we increase the pH and we create a more alkaline environment in the stomach, they'll become more hydrophilic and we won't have the same effect that was intended with that medication. Also, we're going to give two hours before or three hours after these at-risk medications. So it's something just to keep in mind. A couple examples are acepromazine, digoxin, and corticosteroid. We're going to just watch our timing when it comes to giving these buffer type medications. Long-term use, we should monitor electrolyte levels because of course we can get over time calcium and magnesium disruption. Systemic antacids circulate in the body, then they interact with the receptors in the stomach. So these ones actually go through the bloodstream and then they come back, loop back, and interact with the receptors in the stomach. Most common mode of action is that H2 or histamine-based antagonist, and many are available in oral or injectable formulations. So essentially we're skipping this portion of the, the cascade of acidic um, ulcer production. So looking at these H2 systemic antacids, we're talking about cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, and ranitidine is also known as Zantac. You guys, I'm sure, have heard of that before. And famotidine is known as Pepsid, which also is over-the-counter and easily accessible. Cimetidine and ranitidine can affect metabolism of other drugs. They can slow down the hepatic metabolism of cardiac drugs, such as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and quinidine. Theophylline can also be affected in anticonvulsant drugs such as diazepam and phenytoin. Proton pump inhibitors are another method for producing an antacid effect. So these are also known as acid pump blockers, and we're talking about within that cascade of effects that creates that hydrochloric acid these ones were administered as a paste or enteric coated granules in a capsule. Most common example is omeprazole. 
So they inhibit the proton pump. So they're inhibiting that hydrogen, that positive ion hydrogen pump, which results in a decreased acidity in the stomach. These also can affect other drug metabolism based on locally changing the pH and also through that hepatic aspect. Most often you're going to see omeprazole. We can give it to dogs and cat, uh, cats as well. Mostly you're seeing it in dogs and also in horses because horses are prone to getting ulcers, so gastrointestinal ulcers. Horses, if they are on regular non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, we're often also giving regular omeprazole to help combat and prevent stomach ulcers. So these drugs, it's important not to chew, crush, or open these capsules. The drug is degraded in the stomach acid and it's absorbed in the duodenum. So we need it to pass through the stomach acid unchanged and untouched and enter into the duodenum where it can be absorbed into systemic circulation. Typically, we're looking at three to five days of regular use before we get full effect. And studies show more effective in reducing acid levels than regular old H2 antagonists in pets. So here, just looking at how it's working, it's actually preventing the pro proton pump from allowing those hydrogen ions to come into the stomach or be released to the stomach. Too many hydrogen ions, of course, create a very acidic environment in the stomach. So by pre preventing this pump from occurring, then we're going to keep those hydrogen ions in the extracellular space and not allow them to pass through into that uh, hydrochloric acid space. Mucosal protectants, so I talked about these a little bit in the last lecture. Sucralfate is the one that we often are using and typically we consider sucralfate the band-aid for the stomach. Sulcrate is its trade name and it binds with the protein in the ulcer. So it actually creates this little thick bandage at the ulcer site by binding with the protein in the actual ulcer. It relies on an acidic environment. So it goes in as a liquid orally. And then once it comes into contact with the hydrochloric acid, it creates an acidic, or sorry, it creates a paste. So it turns into this big thick globular paste. There's a little bit of debate as to whether or not it should be used alongside antacids because it does rely on this uh, heavily acidic environment to create that paste. We're not sure entirely if its mode of action is going to be changed if we slightly reduce the acidity of the stomach. Have to have caution though, this one we definitely want to separate from other oral drugs and feedings by at least one to two hours, depending on that animal's uh, gastric motility. And that's because it is binding to protein, so it will bind to the protein in drugs and food as well. And then we have prostaglandin E1 analogs. So we know that prostaglandin E1 so PGE and PGI, they are both those prostaglandins that help produce those protective mechanisms in the stomach. So PGI, PGE help produce that thick mucus that will add that protective layer to the stomach, help protect against stomach acid, help redirect blood flow, assist with blood flow to the gastrointestinal system. So these are both protective prostaglandins. So when we're looking at prostaglandin E1 analogs, we're looking at drugs that mimic the effects of prostaglandin E1. Specifically, we're most often talking about mesoprostol, also known as Cytotec in human medication, and it mimics, again, the natural PG1 in the stomach. So we get that protective mechanism increased. This one specifically is going to increase intestinal mucus and fluid production. It will decrease gastric hydrochloric acid production. It will increase intestinal motility, improve blood flow to areas where prostaglandins are active, and it will increase secretions of bicarbonate buffers in the mucus layer in the stomach. There is a huge caution with using mesoprostol. So of course, because we're affecting prostaglandins, we know that pr prostaglandins definitely are protective mechanisms and they provide protective action to some areas of the body, 
but at the same time, they have other effects on the body as well. Just like when we're blocking prostaglandins for non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, we're blocking the inflammation, but we're also blocking the protective mechanisms. So we just have to watch out, be very cautious when using these drugs. Prostaglandin E1 side effects can cause gastrointestinal cramping, so it could cause cramping, diarrhea, and colic in horses. So we have to be very cautious if we're using in horses because they're very susceptible, very sensitive to colic, to developing colic. We can also get severe uterine contractions. So if we're using this in an animal that's pregnant, then we can cause a premature birth or abortion. So this is with caution in pets and people. In humans, it causes miscarriage. So this is actually the medication that's given as the um, as a, an abortion pill for humans in early stage pregnancy. So we have to be very cautious. We don't even if we're pregnant, we don't even go near this drug. Even with gloves, it's just not worth the risk. So we tend to uh, give it to somebody else who's not pregnant. They will always wear gloves when touching this. Anytime you're touching a prostaglandin analog or a mechanism, a drug that's working with prostaglandins to produce prostaglandin effects or disrupt prostaglandin effects, we always, always wear gloves. We always wear our personal protective equipment because it's just not worth it to have it um, potentially absorbed into our body and have an effect. So pregnant, you don't touch this drug at all. So here's a case example. So this dog was given, this small dog, he was given non steroidal anti-inflammatories. So he was given ibuprofen at home by the owner, and he was given 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. What you guys will learn more so next year is that ibuprofen is not tolerated by dogs and cats. They don't, they don't tolerate it very well at all. And essentially, ibuprofen is an, a non steroidal anti-inflammatory, so it's blocking prostaglandin effects in order to block the inflammatory effects of prostaglandins. Unfortunately, it's blocking the bad and the good prostaglandins. So what ends up happening is they get a huge amount of gastrointestinal side effects. Within 24 hours, this little guy was vomiting blood, and he had blood in his stool. So he definitely had suspected gastric or duodenal ulcers. So looking at this case, which medications would be beneficial for this guy? So the dog was placed on famotidine. So we've got an antacid. He was given famotidine intravenously. He was given sulcrate orally. So that will help actually bind to the protein of the ulcer site and act as a band-aid. And then he was given misoprostol to help combat the effects of the prostaglandins being blocked and help encourage those prostaglandins to come back. So the other thing that would have been very beneficial to this dog is we would have also given an, an emetic agent. So if this had happened within half an hour to an hour of her giving the medication and she called us to ask, then in that case we would have given an emetic agent caused the dog to vomit, and then given activated charcoal to help absorb the ibuprofen in the dog's system. We would still carry on with famotidine and sulcrate if you were showing clinical signs. However, this client gave her dog this medication earlier in the day, and by the time it came to us, it came to us because it was having gastrointestinal side effects. So we weren't able to combat the direct um, ingestion of the toxic drug but unfortunately we were or fortunately we were able to combat some of those side effects by using gastrointestinal medication okay moving on to miscellaneous gastrointestinal medications we've got antimicrobials and we'll talk a little bit more about these when we talk about antimicrobials but we're going to minimize use to appropriate bacterial caused diarrhea one of the most common gastrointestinal antimicrobials is tylosin. So we're going to avoid tylosin in horses because they can actually get the opposite effect and they can get death by diarrhea. We often are using this with calf scours, so calf diarrhea, IBD, irritable bowel disease, and clostridial colitis. 
I know that my cat who has IBD, we often give her pulse doses of Tylosin to help combat sort of inappropriate levels of bacteria in her gut. There's also just Tylosin responsive diarrhea syndrome, <laughs> which we don't know exactly necessarily what's causing it, but it's one of those situations where sometimes we'll just try Tylosin in ongoing or intermittent diarrhea cases to see if it works, and if it does, then that's a great option for pulse antibiotic use. It is off-label for use in dogs and cats, but we quite often use it, especially if metronidazole doesn't work for them. So more antimicrobials, My, uh, metronidazole is very, very common. It's an antibacterial and antiprotozoal drug. So quite often we're using metronidazole in fairly long-term doses for Giardia, so for an antiprotozoal, which of course Giardia is a protozoal parasite. And this one will also decrease intestinal inflammation by decreasing the anaerobic bacteria. High dose or really chronic use, you have to be cautious because you can get central nervous system challenges, so you can get weakness, head tilt, staggering, disorientation, proprioceptive deficits, and seizures with long-term or high dose use. This also can affect serotonin syndrome, which we talked about a little bit with some of our drugs. So serotonin syndrome, essentially it's mocking the effects of serotonin in the brain, which of course is causing all of the above symptoms. So the weakness, the head tilt, staggering, etc. 10 to 15 days is the ideal maximum dose. However, a lot of dogs especially are on it for longer periods of time, especially if they do have Giardia. And it is prohibited in production animals because we don't have the safety in place for human consumption. Erythromycin, oh, and also metronidazole, you'll hear it called flagell as its trade name. Erythromycin can produce intestinal motility. It mimics motilin, which is the hormone essentially that's secreted to increase peristalsis and motility. And it stimulates serotonin receptors. It can increase muscle tone in the lower esophagus and increase stomach contraction. So it can help move things through to a degree. And then we have oral electrolyte solutions, such as sodium, potassium, and chloride, mixed up together in an oral solution. So this typically we're giving to calves and lambs and foals who have diarrhea. The goal of this is to replace ion losses from vomiting and scours. So scours, of course, is another word for diarrhea. We typically use this when IV administration may be impractical. So due to cost or the logistics of having a farm or production animal hooked up to IV fluids for a period of time to help combat that fluid loss. So typically what we'll do is give a, a stomach tube or an esophageal tube and we'll just essentially drench them with the electrolyte solution. You have to have caution in severe intestinal, if there is severe intestinal damage from prolonged scours or from a parasitic infection, because it will impair the body's ability to absorb the electrolytes. And then we have rumen drugs. So the rumen contractions help uh, process the food, they keep the microbes healthy and balance the gut and fermentation. When the animal's sick, they can get rumen stasis, so essentially a stagnant or still rumen. This results in poor digestion, death from bloat, because the bacteria aren't getting churned around and moved around. Instead, they're just sitting there and producing copious amounts of gas. So they could actually have death from the amount of gas accumulating in their rumen and death from rumen acidosis. Again, a lot of bacteria produce acid as a byproduct, which is great in some cases, but it has to be in balance. Ruminatorics, such as neost neostigmine, I can never say that properly, stimulates the peripheral nervous system by binding acetylcholine esterase. So essentially that's allowing acetylcholine to have a longer or prolonged um, and more significant effect on the peripheral nervous system. Rumin drugs, we have ionophores, such as Monensin, which is an antimicrobial, anticoccidial drug, and it disrupts the electrolyte and water balance in the organism. 
It's used to balance the rumen microbe population. We also use it in chickens for coccidiosis, so when they have coccidia-type infections. It is toxic to horses, so we don't use it in horses. And then we have anti-bloat, which of course will help the, the, the cow or the ruminant burp, erectate. So we can give this either through stomach tube or through chokerization and empty it directly into the rumen, which if we go back here, this is a chokerized rumen. So some cows, especially if they have chronic rumen issues, they'll get essentially a fenestration placed. So this little window placed in the rumen and it's like a stoma that allows access to the outside world. So a lot of times it's it acts as, it could be long-term or it could be short-term to trocherize, so release some of the gas, and then be able to administer drugs directly into the rumen itself. So for this case, uh, the anti-bloat reduces viscosity or rumen contents and allows foam and bubbles to dissipate. And then corticosteroids, which of course are a bit of, um, it's a little bit of a catch-22 because they can cause bad things as well in the gastrointestinal tract. So we're talking about prednisolone and, uh, or sorry, prednisone or prednisolone and dexamethasone. These are potent anti-inflammatories, immunosuppressive drugs. And we'd give these ones with chronic inflammatory bowel conditions as well as intestinal lymphoma. So anything that is an autoimmune condition or a condition such as cancer where we have chronic inflammation, then we're going to use corticosteroids. Caution, of course, it depresses the immune system in high doses and it increases gastric acid production and it decreases protective mechanisms. Long-term use also, we have to watch out for kidney and liver function through metabolism and excretion. Something to keep in mind, but you might see some cats be put on prednisolone for long-term use if they have irritable bowel syndrome or dogs who have gastrointestinal lymphoma will be placed on corticosteroids to help reduce some of that inflammation during treatment. Pancreatic enzyme supplementation is very specific. It's for use in animals that have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And most often, we're talking about German Shepherd dogs. So essentially, this is lipase, amylase, and multiple proteases. So this mimics the gastrointestinal or the digestive enzymes that are normally produced by the pancreas. In these dogs who have pancreatic um, or exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, they don't produce lipase, amylase, and the proteases very well in their body. So what that ends up meaning is they get maldigestion, malabsorption, and this osmotic diarrhea, so this um, fat-filled diarrhea. And the stool is this sort of pale or yellow, undigested, fatty, kind of uh, huge patties of diarrhea which is fed on by bacteria. So essentially what's happening is in their gut, they're not digesting the fat properly. The fat gets pushed through the gastrointestinal system and the bacteria start feeding on it in the colon and it actually makes it rancid. So it's this really putrid smelling, um, pale, greasy diarrhea that these dogs get that's typical for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So it's a supplement that we're going to give these guys, and it could be, there's a couple different names for it. It's Viocase is one, and essentially it's a powder that you're going to mix with food 15 to 20 minutes before feeding. We don't want to use the tablet form. We actually need the powder form to be working in the upper GI tract. There is, however, a challenge with deactivation of the enzymes that were given through hydrochloric acid. So some dogs it works very well in, and other dogs it doesn't work very well at all in, and it's just a method of trial and error. And then we have prebiotics, which are a fiber source food for gut bacteria. So essentially certain food that we're feeding to help to, uh, flourish the bacteria in the gut. So we're actually feeding the bacteria in the gut. So an example is fructo oligosaccharides, such as soybeans, oats, and fructose-based inulin examples are jicama, uh, sorry, and chicory root. So these are given in <clears throat> specific cases where we need to help that gut bacteria repopulate. 
And it's just something to mention that not all fibers are prebiotics, just some of these specific fibers you may see or come across. And then of course we have our widely used probiotics, which introduce beneficial bacteria to the gut environment. So these ones are formulated to survive the acid and bile found in the gastrointestinal tract and actually make it through into the small intestine and large intestine. Requirements overall is to adhere to the intestinal cells or transiently colonize various areas within the gastrointestinal tract. They exclude or reduce pathogenic bacteria adherence. They produce accident or accidents. They produce acids, hydrogen peroxide, and or bacteriocidins that antagonize the growth of pathogens. They co-aggregate to help achieve normal balanced microflora population. And they have to be safe, non-invasive, non-carcinogenic, and non-pathogenic to the animal. So essentially what I'm saying here is they have a very specific role. They generally have to be given every day for that period of treatment time or else every time the animal has a bowel movement, there's likelihood that the bacteria will pass through with the feces and it won't recolonize. They also have to be beneficial to the animal. So we have to be cautious because dogs and cats, of course, have, and as well as ruminants and hindgut fermenters, they all have very different gut bacteria compared to humans. So it's not easy to say that we can just swap out our human probiotic and give it to the dogs and cats. They need ones that are very specific to their gastrointestinal tract. But this essentially helps recolonize the bacteria in the gut to help create more of a positive and effective gut bacteria in the gastrointestinal system. And then of course in your nutrition classes I'm certain that you'll learn all about bland diets, so the gastrointestinal diets that are available to animals to help combat diarrhea. And then here, this is interesting, so this is a newer thing that's happening in veterinary medicine. So this is a fecal transplant. So of course Going back to that concept of replacing the bad gut bacteria with good bacteria to help be more efficient and effective in breaking down food materials and helping with the absorption process, we have now the option to do fecal transplants, whereby dogs and cats, who and, and as well as ruminants and horses, etc., who have been identified to have good gut bacteria and really good bowel movements, we could actually give animals who have chronic bacteria, or uh, well, yeah, chronic bacterial diarrhea, we can give them enemas that contain good stool to help recolonize and repopulate the bacterial growth in their gut. So it's kind of neat. It's happening a lot now in human medicine with really good effects. And we can do it in an enema form or also an enteric coated capsule of little desiccated, dehydrated stool samples. So it's something to think about. It's gross at first, but it can have some pretty amazing benefits for the human or the animal that we're, that's being used on. And that is it. 